Thanks, Leopold, for that very kind introduction. And I guess I'll be British for another year or two until we succeed. And then Scotland will be a separate country. But, uh, um, but at the moment, I'm still British. Um, uh, even though we're the, the last session of the day, uh, uh, and it may sound repetitive, it, I'm sure just as sincere on behalf of all of us, but uh, to say thank you to Dana and to uh, the Basirius Law School for the invitation uh, to attend and participate in, in this event, which I think has been very interesting so far, and I hope we can keep the interest going, even though we're getting a little bit later in the day. Uh, in our first two sessions today, we've heard about intellectual property law uh, and how it, in seeking to incentivize uh, creative activity, how it might actually instead limit access to knowledge and in the process impede follow-on creativity and repress competition. We've heard also some of, the dis some of the ways in which patent law or copyright law might be reconfigured uh, to avoid those adverse effects uh, without undermining the purposes that warrant protection in the first place. But first blush, if you read uh, the dominant scholarship of the late 20th century, uh, it would appear that trademark protection actually doesn't create as many impediments to market access as copyright or patent law. Um, that scholarship routinely argues that trademark law fosters competition, contributes to an efficient marketplace by reducing search costs, and has little adverse effect uh, on market access. Uh, in the same vein, if I can work the... All right. In the same vein, the European Court of Justice has now for over two decades seen trademark protection essentially as a positive force in promoting a competitive uh, marketplace. So you go back to the 1990 Kaffee Hague II judgment, the court explained that Trademark rights are an essential element in the system of undistorted competition. Enterprises must be able to gain customers by the quality of their products or services, and this can be done only by virtue of the existence of distinctive science permitting identification of those products and services. Likewise, uh, in the United States, just two years after that Kaffee Hag decision in Europe, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in two pesos, uh, which is probably the high water mark or low water mark, depending on which view you, you take of U.S. trademark protection during the last 25 years. Um, in that decision, the American court suggested that a secondary meaning requirement for trade dress protection would undermine the congressional determination underlying the Lanham Act that trademark protection, and I quote, fosters competition by securing to the producer of the benefits, the benefits of a good reputation. But even if trademarks can contribute to enhance competition and efficient, market, efficient markets, um, might why might there be such a relaxed approach to the possibility that affording a single producer uh, the exclusive right to use a mark might, in some circumstances, have anti-competitive effects? Well, in large part, this attitude, uh, this almost relaxed attitude, flows from the fact that trademark law classically protected only a particular type of information, that's source identifying information against limited uses of that information, that is, uses that undermined the, sor undermined the source identification of the function of the mark by, protecting, by confusing consumers. Historically, that information, the protected information, was embodied in a word or a logo that was attached to the product. As a result, trademark law did not preclude a rival producer from placing a competitive product on the market, provided the product was differently marked. A trademark, therefore, rarely conferred market power. Under this vision, there was always competitive open space uh, between the exclusivity conferred by the mark and the scope of the product market in which the mark goods were sold, which can be represented, I think, a little bit like that. Um, I'll come back to that slide in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is not to say that scholars or policymakers have always been completely sanguine about the competitive effects of trademark protection. Uh, in the 1930s, there was... Uh, great skepticism about the role of advertising for a number of reasons, but particularly in stimulating false consumer demand. And in that climate, uh, economists, particularly from the Harvard School, Edward Chamberlain, argued that trademark protection uh, reinforced monopoly power and created barriers to market entry. And that argument from the 30s was eventually, in the United States, defeated only in the 1980s, when the conclusion of a nine-year proceeding uh, brought by the Federal Trade Commission against Borden uh, was settled. In that proceeding, the FTC had challenged what it saw as trademark sustained monopolies and sought, and one time actually obtained from an administrative law judge, a royalty-free compulsory license of Borden's Real Lemon trademark to any competitor in the processed lemon juice industry. However, in 1983, the Republicans came to power, uh, and the FTC reversed course uh, and settled the Borden complaint, actually by three to two at the commission. 
um, and accepted that product differentiation, in fact, enhanced competition. A decade later, as Rito actually mentioned this morning, uh, Article 21 of the TRIPS Agreement would consolidate that process and outlaw and prohibit um, the compulsory licensing of trademarks as a matter of international law. Of course, during that 50 years of theoretical economic debate about the relationship between product differentiation uh, and competition, as that went on, policymakers did continue to scrutinize the competitive effects of particular features of trademark law. Um, so, for example, during that time, the U.S. Department of Justice opposed the Lanham Act, the major piece of American contemporary trademark legislation in, in the late 1930s, because it thought registration of descriptive terms and the concept of incontestability, essentially quiet title, uh, would be anti-competitive. The Department of Justice also supported a provision that I think is very interesting that would have caused a trademark registration that was, and I quote, the sole name of an article having patent protection to expire two years after the expiration of the patent. Ultimately, that patent expiry issue was dealt with by provision on genericide, which later became Section 14.3 of the American statute. And the department secured other concessions, including uh, 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 the right of the uh, Federal Trade Commission to petition for cancellation of trademark registration. But the recent French law uh, that precludes mark owners from enjoining their marks against generic pharmaceuticals after patent expiry is in many ways actually just a specific instantiation of the approach that the Department of Justice was pushing in the United States in the late 1930s and early 1940s. In the last few years, these concerns about the anti-competitive effects of trademark law have been expressed uh, even more forcefully. Uh, thus, in a number of cases since the two pesos case I mentioned, the U.S. Supreme Court has cautioned that concerns about competition um, are implicated as much by overprotection of marks as by underprotection. And as a result, in a series of cases, most notably Traffics and Walmart in 2000 and 2001, the court cut back on trademark protection. On this side of the Atlantic, a leading uh, British IP judge, Lord Justice Jacob, as he then was, now Professor Jacob, painted a stark picture of how the details of European trademark law implicated serious concerns about competition. So in the O2 versus Hutchinson case, which those of you on this side of the Atlantic may know about, he commented, and I quote, the trial judge opened his judgment saying, this is a case about bubbles. And so it is, but it is also about a lot more. The question, which is about comparative advertising of mobile telephone services, deep down involves a decision based upon the philosophy of how competitive the law allows European industry to be. He actually meant British industry, but he just said European industry. It picks up on the point that Leopold mentioned. And even the ability of uh, uh, trademark protection to make its positive contribution to competition uh, as an avenue, uh, an entry to the market, has been called into question. So the recent Max, Max Planck uh, trademark review for the Commission investigated potentially adverse effects on competition, not only from overbroad protection that might come from protecting particular marks, but also from the aggregated clutter that might arise from liberal registration rules precluding producers from finding adequate marks to allow them in, to enter the market uh, uh, with clear product differentiation. So before, before turning to the reasons uh, for uh, uh, increased concerns, why we have these increased concerns about the effects of trademark on competition, um, uh, I want to note that even if the, pro the, the product differentiation argument and the pro-competitive effects of product differentiation dominated as a matter of the economic theoretical debate during this time, um, competitive values are often successfully invoked um, uh, in the doctrinal level in courts. And in most cases, when they are, they tend to cut back on protection, notwithstanding the overall macroeconomic argument in favor of product differentiation. So for example, and I've got someone on the slides, uh, denying protection to descriptive terms uh, preserves the ability of competitors to convey to consumers uh, the essential characteristics of their products, and likewise, the same can be said uh, for generic terms, right? The non-protection of generic terms ensure that exclusive rights in a mark uh, doesn't extend to give you control of the entire uh, uh, entire market. Likewise, the functionality doctrine, which we'll come to in a lot more detail in a minute, is explicitly driven uh, by concerns about competition. Concern for competition can also be seen in rules that regulate what can be registered as a mark. So, for example, in Europe, the graphical representation requirement, which is often seen, and you see this in the Max Planck study, as a technical matter. But the criteria articulated by the Court of Justice in the Siegman case reflect, in fact, a very fundamental concern, 
that rival traders must be able easily to assess the nature of trademark rights which they have to avoid. Likewise, in Dyson, the case involving the vacuum cleaner, the court was clearly concerned that overbroad claiming would be, and I quote, an abuse of trademark law in order to obtain an unfair competitive advantage. It could actually have used the functionality doctrine as the Advocate General did in that case, um, but instead it denied uh, the registration of, uh, of, in a general and an abstract manner, of all conceivable shapes of a transparent collecting bin for vacuum cleaners um, on the slightly concocted ground of the meaning of the term sign and, importantly, the graphic representation requirement. In the United States, uh, the Qualitex Court in 1995 largely removed restrictions on protectable subject matter. Uh, we don't have a graphic representation requirement. Um, the assimilation of the scope of registered uh, uh, registration rules and unregistered protection under Section 43A means that registration formalities tend to play less of a century role uh, uh, in the United States. However, the basic same concern that competition can be repressed by virtue of uncertainty among rival producers, uh, which clearly animates the graphic representation requirement in Europe, uh, is explicitly at the root of the US Supreme Court's decision in Walmart about the secondary meaning requirement for product designs. And the concerns of abuse of claiming that are explicitly motivating the Court of Justice in the Dyson case have been echoed by a couple of courts in the United States in trade dress cases recently. Competition concerns are also reflected in defenses to trademark liability, descriptive use, nominative use, comparative advertising, first sale, all serve to enhance competition in the marketplace. The range of defenses in Europe under Article 6 is, I think, uh, uh, somewhat less generous, to be polite. Um, for example, those no nominative fair use defense, and I think the comparative advertising directive has been read close to a nullity uh, over the last couple of years. But the doctrinal entry point exists of using defenses and the Max Planck study actually suggests making greater use of that entry point uh, by revising the available defenses. So in short, despite what you might think about reading the macroeconomic theory that supports product differentiation, the possibility of incorporating concerns about competition clearly exists pervasively through throughout the entire uh, doctrinal structure of the trademark system. All right, that's so. Why have uh, courts and scholars become increasingly concerned? about the possibility that trademark law is becoming anti-competitive. Well, I've got five reasons, uh, sorry, four reasons that I want to, I did a five, I was giving it four, uh, that, uh, that I want to uh, suggest. Um, first, we've expanded without limit the form of symbol that embodies source identification information. Words and two-dimensional logos remain still the main form, um, and they can affect uh, have competitive kind of consequences, but on the whole, having to call one's product by a different name uh, doesn't impede uh, access to the marketplace. But once you recognize that product features can act as marks, a prohibition against replicating the source identifier actually becomes uh, an impediment uh, on entering the mark. So you end up with that essentially uh, ending up uh, like that in terms of the convergence of mark and market. That convergence of mark and market uh, that generates competitive concerns might also arise instead of being, as a result, changes in the subject matter of the mark, uh, but by the creation of markets that are defined and constituted by the mark. Right? So trademarks have become assets in and of themselves, such that consumers do not regard differently marked products as acceptable substitutes. This is the rise of merchandising, um, and indeed many implicates the concerns that Chamberlain identified in the 1930s. Third, we live in an increasingly networked environment. Changes in business models uh, have made related derivative products more significant. In that climate, third-party uses of marks become important in order to access particular derivative markets and defenses such as Article 6.1c of the directive uh, uh, that would allow you to make use of marks to sell interoperable products have to wrestle increasingly with very, very strong association-based infringement doctrines that minimize the application of those types of defenses. Finally, there have been changes in the functions that trademarks perform for consumers and other third parties. Trademarks remain to this day very powerful shortcuts, but they're increasingly used not simply to identify the particular product that you wish to buy. In some sense, uh, marks are being used further upstream in the cognitive process. Uh, even without implicating a mark becoming generic, protecting marks have become means um, by which consumers shop at quite a high level of abstraction for related, complementary, or even sometimes quite different products. 
So when a consumer types the word Nike into a search engine, he or she may be using the trademark to find places online where he can find sneakers or training shoes. Fifteen years ago, when a consumer walked into an online uh, a bricks and mortar store and asked for Nike, he was more likely asking to be directed to a particular brand. Um, so the significance of that change, of course, has led to substantial litigation surrounding keyword advertising. Well, that's a lot, but it's the first half of what I'm going to talk about. So to summarize, uh, um, the types of issues you might want to talk about if you had uh, four days to discuss trademarks and access to the marketplace. But what I'm going to do for the rest of my remarks, the uh, second half, is focus on one of the many issues that I've raised and that I know Martin uh, and Stacy will come back to, and that is the doctrine of functionality under which, under both U.S. and EU law, uh, yeah, is a basis to invalidate a mark even though it might actually have acquired uh, distinctiveness as a source of identifier as an empirical matter. All right. Um, why now? Why talk about functionality? Well, functionality has been heavily litigated in the United States for a very long time, and I think it is probably the most messed up area of U.S. law. You can look at all the opinions, and it is simply inconceivable to find anything remotely resembling coherence. Despite that, uh, in uh, 2001, most people thought the Supreme Court in traffics uh, had cleared a little bit of it up. I actually think the traffic's opinion is absolutely full of internal inconsistencies. The number of errors you can fit into five pages is really quite remarkable. But the lower courts have understood it, despite that, quite clearly to signal very clearly that they should be erring on the side of under protection and free competition. So regardless of the mess in the opinion, they got the message. Um, as a result, we've had a decade of relative quiescence in functionality litigation, but a couple of recent cases, in particular Louboutin, which I'll come back to at the end of my remarks, and Becton Dickinson, have re-energized scholarly debates about the functionality doctrine and about traffic. On the European side, uh, the vintage and volume of functionality doctrine really depends on how long a particular country has protected product shapes. Um, but we've now got, um, on a European-wide basis, a body granted smaller than the United States um, of European uh, functionality law because Article 3 of the Directive and 7 of the regulation include a set of functionality uh, provisions. All right. Oh, I'll we'll get, we'll get back to that second. All right. Although the Court of Justice hasn't had much to say on the question, it's only had a few cases, um, it's arguably got to a, a position very, very close to that uh, as traffic's. Um, despite that, it has, even with little opportunity, to wander, I think, astray in a couple of ways, uh, cases, though it might have a chance in a case pending from Holland at the moment to get back on course in the chocolate vine case. Um, and the Max Planck study uh, suggested uh, some reforms uh, to the functionality provision, both to remedy the narrowness of the uh, technical functionality provision and deal with uh, unwise wandering uh, of the uh, Court of Justice with respect to, with respect to aesthetic functionality. So uh, there's a lot happening. Uh, what I'm going to do very, very quickly, because uh, uh, Stacy and Mark will refer to some of this law, is just briefly set out uh, sort of the core of both where I think American law and European law is now, and then uh, suggest where I think it needs to go in the future. So if you look at traffics, these are the four basic propositions that I think with some generous um, uh, editing uh, you can get out of the traffics opinion. First of all, uh, that the main test of functionality is the one from Inwood from way back in the 1980s, a case involving generic drugs, uh, that if something is essential to the use or purpose of the article or affects its cost to quality, it's functional. Second holding is to do with utility patents and their effect, and basically there's strong evidence that the features claimed in the patent are functional as a matter of trademark. Uh, there is a theoretical rebuttal, but I don't think we've ever managed to find one that's been rebutted when the evidential inference has been triggered in 10 years. Thirdly, they said that when uh, we said uh, we gave an elaboration of the meaning of the Inwood test in Qualitex, mm, really we were talking in a slightly different context. Uh, we were talking about aesthetic functionality, and so don't take those two things as synonymous, uh, the Inwood test and the Qualitex test. And then finally, they said, and this was very important on the practical level, if the Inwood test is satisfied, it's functional. End of discussion. We don't want to hear about alternative designs. We don't want to hear about competitive analysis. Now, those four propositions uh, alone could generate any number of contentious questions of interpretation, particularly as regards the interpretation and the relationship between the first three. But as I say, 10 years later, the majority of courts have taken the message that uh, uh, there had previously been overprotection of uh, product designs have confined 
um, the scope of trade dress rights and designs. In particular, in the application of both tests, courts have taken note of the evidentiary rulings and traffics. So the appearance of a feature in a utility patent has in most cases, but not all, um, been a death knell for trademark protection. And likewise, courts have been unwilling to allow uh, defendant uh, plaintiffs to use the availability of alternative designs to get out of a functionality determination, though they have finessed that a little bit by saying that uh, sometimes when we can't answer the question, we might have to look at alternative designs to work out whether something's essential in the first place. I actually think that was an inevitable finessing um, uh, of prior law that has allowed the appeal courts essentially to continue looking at the same factors they looked at before, but with through a much more free competition lens uh, when the design is a subject of patent in particular, but more th through a more free competition lens that they were told to look through by the Supreme Court in traffic. The position in Europe uh, essentially is, is structured around the directive. These are the three functionality exclusions uh, in the directive. The first one is close to meaningless, natural functionality. And the reason for that um, is that the uh, court has, and particularly the general court level, has basically said that's only going to be uh, have any bite uh, when there's only one um, a shape that the product can be as a matter of nature. So people said you can't register the shape of a banana for a banana. Uh, this is not a particularly useful uh, uh, exclusion. Um, the second, um, uh, uh, the second, oh, go back. The second uh, uh, indent of this one up here uh, is what is uh, called uh, technical functionality. It really is the European equivalent of Inwood. Uh, and the Court of Justice opinion in uh, Illego and Phillips, which are the cases involving that three-headed shaver and that um, uh, uh, building block of, of Lego. Uh, placed the court very, very close to the U.S. Supreme Court in traffic. Uh, in particular, this court has refused to read the word necessarily in Articles 3 uh, and 7 uh, to mean the availability of alternative designs will get you off the hook uh, on an invalidity question. The third end, end, which is the European equivalent of aesthetic functionality, if I can get to it, or I'll get to the second, um, uh, has proven the hardest for the court to get a handle on. Uh, and this may not indeed be surprising, uh, given uh, the difficulties that the American courts had over the years with aesthetic functionality. Uh, indeed, the Max Planck study suggests eliminating this third uh, ground of exclusion and instead dealing with the problems of aesthetic functionality under the broader, broadened version of technical functionality. The problems for the Court of Justice in this uh, uh, regard started in a case uh, of Benetton and G-Star, which is a case about the design on the genes uh, uh, that were marketed uh, by, uh, by G-Star. And the Court of Justice in that case held that the substantial value functionality exclusion, the third end, end applied even though the appellate court in Amsterdam had held that the reputation of the G-Star genes was largely attributable not to the aesthetic attractiveness of the shape, but to the attractiveness of the shape resulting from recognition of it as a mark. The court's overbroad reading is probably to do with a slightly odd interpretation of timing questions. And you could have forgiven, uh, I think, uh, uh, the court and read it in a, uh, in a way that preserved the distinction between uh, uh, value qua shape and value qua mark. But in the subsequent Bang & Olufsen case, which involved the speaker that I have on the screen last October, the court denied protection to that speaker um, uh, under the aesthetic functionality substantial value ground, even though they said, uh, or noting in particular, that the applicant admits that the design is an essential element of its branding and increased the appeal of the product. An essential element of its branding, right, uh, to do with mark and reputation. Now, Stacey and Martin are going to spend uh, more time going into the details of those um, uh, and the interpretive issues they raise, but I want to conclude by doing two things. First, I want to suggest that each jurisdiction could learn a little bit from each other, uh, and I'm going to suggest one lesson to be learned in each direction. The biggest problem about the European functionality doctrine is the court's failure to recognize that the aesthetic functionality exclusion rests upon denying a competitive advantage that would come from something other than source identification. So clearly I'm at a competitive disadvantage that I can't call my carbonated soft drinks Coke, but that's not what the exclusions are aimed at. This is well captured in the formulation of the U.S. Supreme Court in Qualitex when it asks whether or not you are a, uh, a significant non-reputation related disadvantage. Even the British courts get this. Uh, uh, hardly lovers of shape marks. Um, but Mr. Justice Jacob in the Phillips case involving the shaver 
uh, said, what is meant is an exclusion of shapes which exclusively adds some sort of value to the goods, disregarding any valuable attributable to a trademark. So the Ro Rolls-Royce grill adds value to the Rolls-Royce, but it does so primarily because it signifies Rolls-Royce and not because of its inherent shape. Uh, Jacob's emphasis on the importance of separating trademark value from aesthetic value, I think, needs to be uh, uh, recognized uh, by the court, and I hope they will take the chance to basically endorse the Qualitex language in the chocolate vine case. In the other direction, I think U.S. courts would do well to de-emphasize the direct doctrinal relevance of expired patents to functionality analysis. No one disputes that the creation of the functionality doctrine is in large part to preserve the integrity of the patent system. That's found in the uh, uh, doctrine and the case law in both the United States and Europe. And European courts clearly recognize that prior patent protection does tend to support a finding of technical functionality. Uh, but they have, I'll go past one there. But they have resisted and rejected efforts to rest the denial of trademark protection uh, on the existence of the patent itself alone. Uh, so, for example, Mr. Justice Jacob, uh, in the uh, Phillips case, even though he found technical functionality, refused to say that he would deny the trademark protection on the basis of the expired patent or the patent being expired, saying, I would only add this about the it was once patented argument. In general, there is no rule of law which prevents one type of intellectual property right from running parallel to another, as long as there's a good reason uh, independently for both of them. He was able to use the technical functionality argument um, to get to the desirable result and allow competition in the marketplace. Some American courts get this. Recently, Judge Easterbrook's uh, Franco opinion, I think, put it very well when he described a patent as basically a cheat sheet for a court to work out that something had technical functionality. But many American courts don't, and I think many American scholars don't, and they want to cast this debate in terms of a right to copy. Um, I see why that's attractive. Uh, rights have rhetorical push, and in the context in which many of these American cases came up, which is the, basically a, a competition between state and federal laws, the language of rights is very, very useful. But I think it should be resisted, and the European approach preferred for several reasons. First, I think descriptively the traffic's court rejected, or at least declined to follow that route, uh, which was urged on it by a good number of parties. Secondly, defining the precise scope of any doctrinally, direct doctrinal right to copy is theoretically hard. It would depend on whether your basis for this is an election theory, a patent bargain theory, uh, ontological allocation of subject matter uh, to different regimes, you would end up with a completely different right to copy depending on which of those theories you endorse. And in fact, the difficulties of trying to do that can even be seen by looking at the case law since traffics, trying to uh, define the circumstances in which uh, there is an evidentiary inference um, of functionality, both the Fuji case and the Leviton case, courts struggling with, well, it's not technically when the, in the claims of the patent, does that mean the evidentiary inference is triggered, um, which means a whole bunch of judges have to start interpreting claims of patent without any ability to do so, without the procedural devices that are normally in place to help them doing so. Now, of course, some scholars arguing for the right to copy approach would say we can still avoid uh, a um, technical reading of patents. Basically, we're just going to deny product protection uh, for trade design uh, by, by, by product design by having a really broad sanctified right to copy. Now, that's attractive as well, because the amount of mess that functionality has created uh, is, is, is quite substantial. Um, but I think that sentiment uh, is a little too simple. Uh, I go back to a statement that comes from an early, uh, an early uh, Federal Circuit uh, opinion, but this recently been endorsed within the last month by a new Federal Circuit case, and that is that you have to start thinking about a balance between a default policy right to copy, on the one hand, and the competing policy of protecting consumer understanding that's shown to exist. Uh, I think they are both legitimate policy purposes. And the question is how to balance them. And the Supreme Court has never had to do that because it's always had a rule that told it which to prefer in the cases that came before it. Because all the cases that have come before it uh, involve the conflict between a state law of unfair competition and a federal law of patent. And there is a rule that tells you which to pick in the U.S. Constitution in the case of conflict. Um, and if you were forced to choose, as the Supreme Court uh, uh, would have to, be, would have to uh, why pick patent? In an increasingly visual environment and in an era of global trade when visual images become the lingua franca, um, is in fact protection of shape only a peripheral concern? And are there more balanced approaches? 
um, that might give some protection to consumer understanding, but also not imperil competition. So if you look at the right to copy cases that are often cited, such as Kellogg, those cases, the court said you can copy, but it's conditioned on you taking reasonable efforts to differentiate your product from that of the plaintiff under unfair competition law. And finally, I think most more pragmatically, perhaps the courts are getting there uh, using uh, the general policy purpose behind the integrity of the patent system without having to devise these very complex doctrinal devices. So finally, um, are there any other analytical devices that might help us work through the problem of functionality? Well, I'm going to mention three, if only because, uh, and I'll do them very briefly because I've only got a minute or two left, um, and we can perhaps discuss them in Q&A. First of all, I think we need to take uh, uh, and become much more serious about the process of defining a mark narrowly and precisely. So the example I want to use for this is the pending case. Oh, let's do Let's go on. It, it was going to be up, but apparently it's not working. Is it meant to be on? Oh, there. All right. So this is the Louboutin case uh, from the currently on appeal to the Second Circuit in, in uh, uh, New York. Um, I, in this case, the lower court uh, denied protection to the red color on the sole of the Louboutin shoes, finding it uh, to be functional uh, under what I suppose is the aesthetic functionality doctrine. Um, if the mark in that case that, that was registered had been more narrowly defined to be the contrasting sole, red sole, on high heeled shoes, I think I would actually have been a little more comfortable with granting trademark protection, allowing Louboutin to assert his rights vis-a-vis -vis other people who basically were selling rip-off Louboutins uh, with just the sole and everything else exactly the same, and also allowing Yves Saint Laurent to market those, which is what the offending, allegedly offending shoes were, the monochromatic red shoes. Um, of course, if you think more precision in claiming is going to be valuable, you need to think about ways by which you effectuate that and incentivize that. Um, and I think the way is actually one of the ways is, uh, is shown in a recent uh, uh, reference from January from the English Court of Appeal uh, to the Court of Justice in the case called Spec Savers. And basically, the, the argument is that if you overclaim, if you claim something other than the contrast, then in fact you are engaging in non use of the mark. A very strict view of the notion of use necessary to maintain rights would be a way, I think, of incentivizing um, uh, narrow claiming. And of course, in the United States, you've got a bit of a problem because under 43A, you have unregistered protection. In that context, your mark is defined not in an application to an office, but actually in court papers. And court papers fall when you know exactly what the defendant's design is that you want to restrain. But in recent years, U.S. courts have become alert to that, and I think that the doctrine that we've had for a long time of separate commercial impression may be a way by which a use-based system uh, essentially also uh, encourages narrower claiming. Um, if you look at the practices in the United Kingdom with respect to unregistered design rights, where the ability to define your design uh, in litigation, looking at the defendant's design, combined with the ability to get protection for any part of a product, even though it might not be marketed separately or perceived separately, that combination has been devastatingly anti-competitive. And so the ability not to be able to do that is something that uh, I think we need to take a uh, uh, close look at. Secondly, to make the limit real on containing, we need to develop the notion um, of uh, what I would call a thin trademark. So even if we can find Louboutin to the contrasting sole, would the monochrome red by Yves Saint Laurent still confuse? Now, I'd be willing to argue no, even under standard confusion analysis, because just because you use a defendant mark, in your mark doesn't mean that you infringe. So there's Coke. Coke is in there, uh, but I guarantee you that's not actually uh, a trademark infringement, or at least I would argue that's not a trademark infringement. I'd be comfortable. But to make sure of that, I think we should consider adopting the rule that your mark is very, very narrow and only barely distinctive, then you basically only get protection against identical imitation, a thin trademark. 20 years ago, the Second Circuit in the Wallace case involving Baroque silverware hinted at this type of thing, though not in that language. I think we need to adopt it. Finally, and I promise finally, Leopold, uh, remember the possibility of limited relief uh, under unfair competition law. Um, that was the heart of the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Kellogg. If you actually say to a court, you can give some protection to the plaintiff, they may ironically and paradoxically be more willing to find functionality uh, because they know they're going to do something to protect consumer understanding. It's there in Kellogg in the United States, and it is there in Lego 
in the European Court of Justice. Even though the European Court of Justice didn't act on it because unfair competition is not a harmonized area, it did say you don't get your trademark rights, but you may have recourse to rules and unfair competitions. One line and paragraph in the Lego opinion. So I think that's also what we should be thinking about. In conclusion, therefore, um, I think there are really hard doctrinal complexities in this area of functionality, but I think there are a series of devices by which we can try and protect what may still in the future be growing forms of consumer identification with the features of a product while still ensuring that trademarks don't become uh, barriers to uh, fair competition. Thank you.